So my name is Gary Dehart, and I'd like to welcome everybody to day two of Future Forward, our virtual conference uh, put on by Insightful Accountant. And we'd like to say thanks to our speakers, Elizabeth uh, Manso and Sharon Fuller. We'll let them introduce themselves in just a minute. My name, again, like I said, is Gary Dehart. I am the publisher and managing partner of Insightful Accountant, host of Accounting Insiders podcast, and host of Future Forward. Uh, before we get rolling, I do want to say thank you to our sponsors, Tech Guru, Davo by Avalara, and Swiznet. Uh, we certainly can't produce these events uh, in this education without their support. So today's event is Building a Team for the New Workforce Reality, Millennials and the Great Resignation. Mm -hmm. Before we dive in and before I uh, really start this conversation, I have a, always have a couple of housekeeping items. So again, like I said, thank you to our sponsors. CPE is available for this session, but just like all the other sessions, you have to be here how many minutes? Five, zero, that should be right, 50 minutes. You have to be here 50 minutes and you have to answer at least three of the poll questions. So uh, if you meet that minimum criteria, we will send you an email as a link to a short survey and it's just a survey saying, hey, what do you think about the session basically? And you complete that, then we'll send you your uh, CPE certificate shortly after that. Usually within this process, if, if everything goes smoothly, you'll get that email tonight. Uh, if not, you'll get it tomorrow. And this will be available. The recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Typically takes about two days to get that posted. As this conversation is going, I will put that uh, URL in the chat. I'll also put a copy of the presentation in the chat as well. And both of those will be sent to you as a follow-up email after this event's over. So that's probably going to be Thursday or Friday. You'll get a link to all of this information for um, for Future Forward. So, and if you do have any questions, if you'd like to make any comments as we go through our discussion, just put them down in the uh, Q&A panel, which should be down in your down in your tray on the bottom of your, of your screen there. So, learning objectives for today, I'm gonna roll through these real quickly. So it's just best practices for ensuring hybrid and remote teams. This is about hybrid and remote, right? How do we, how do we build a firm that's remote? Uh, we've had a lot of practice over the past couple of years to get it right. Best, best methods of finding the right talent in today's market, labor market, and how to manage your overhead costs and now optimize your human resource capacity. And then um, just a practical foundation for making your hiring decisions. Um, you know, Elizabeth and Sharon both uh, work in firms, have a firm uh, or have worked in firms, kind of a combination of all of these things. I, I, Sharon's got a number of things that, that show up on, on her resume there. So, um, worked in, in multiple capacities, I guess, is where I'm getting with that. So with that, I've already told you who I am. So Sharon, who are you? Um, I'm just going to let everybody read my 27 slides for five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> um, Sharon Fuller, CEO of Glass Wallet. Um, why you want to listen to me in this, in this session, I started um, a, a fraction, well, it started as bookkeeping. I started a bookkeeping company in 2006. 100% remote. I started it because I lived in San Diego and I did not want to have to go into an office. I wanted the freedom to be able to work on the beach or the bar, wherever that would be. Keep in mind, I was in my early 20s. So I knew, you know, I wanted to do what I loved. Anyhow, grew it um, into a fractional controller CFO business, kind of full source accounting. And last year it was acquired. And I thought, I always told myself after I acquire, I will, I will retire. And that is not what happened. Instead, I started up a hundred other things, one of them being Glass Wallet, where I really focus on what I, what we call scalable to scalable, which is coaching um, accounting firms, small businesses on how to start, grow, scale, and eventually sell their business. And that's really what I'm doing now. So I've lived in the remote world since 2006. I don't believe in wearing pants to get your work done. And COVID had zero impact on anything we did. And that yeah. is me. <laughs> right. There's a second slide. Oh, only two slides. How about Elizabeth? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Manso, and I own a bookkeeping and accounting firm called Brigade here in Miami. And um, I've been doing this for the last 15 years. And uh, two years ago when the pandemic hit, over two years ago when the pandemic hit, we were in the office before pandemic. And as soon as the pandemic hit, I knew I was going to go remote and I was not going to go back to the office because like Sharon, I love my life and I want to be able to enjoy it. And I want my team to enjoy it. Um, and my team are 100% millennials. I, I totally embrace the millennial mindset. 
And um, in my time that I'm not driving to and from the office, I have time to work to um, train on obstacles because a goal of mine is to become an American Ninja Warrior. And I also compete in salsa and burlesque dancing because I don't have to drive to the office anymore. I can focus on having fun. <laughs> All this extra time. And, yeah. and, and, and we'll, we will clarify that it is the American Ninja Warrior, which you did say, but it doesn't say that on the slide. So yesterday I had to clarify that oh, and make sure it wasn't like a Ninja Warrior, which is okay. I mean, if you want to be a Ninja <laughs> Warrior, you knock yourself out. So, so Elizabeth could kick our, our rear end. So I would remember yeah. that if I disagree with her to quietly, fortunately, she doesn't know where I live because now I'm a little intimidated and scared. Oh, wait, you said Las Vegas. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if not Las Vegas, she will be in, um, she'll be in Amsterdam. So okay, that's right. Uh, you got you. <laughs> so, all right. Well, let's roll on here. So we've got polling question number one. Let's see it moved here. And again, we need you to answer these polls or you need to answer them if you want the CPE. So this is a kind of a two-part poll. Uh, and there you go. And I'll keep it open, uh, not for a long time. So hop in, participate if you're interested in the CPE. And then we'll roll into some of the content. Question is, what portion of your team is remote? And then the second question, have you seen a significant increase in turnover at your firm this year? How about you two? Have you, uh, either of you seen any significant turnover? Us, turnover is in someone leaving? No, I think for us, the issue is finding a good, let me take a step back. The issue with having a remote team is everybody thinks they can be remote until they start working remote and they realize they're not disciplined. And when you're in a really fast paced accounting firm environment, you really don't have the time to teach somebody the discipline to be remote and, you know, to micromanage or whatnot. So people leaving my team, no, <laughs> it's not working out with people that we may bring on for the sole reason that they're not, you know, disciplined. Yes. Right. So, yeah, so, so they may not necessarily be leaving under their own accord. No, I didn't want to say, yeah, we can them. <laughs> yeah, no, the same goes with me. And mostly, I mean, when the pandemic hit, we were 15 and we actually trimmed down to 10 because we got our processes so efficient that we realized we had, we trimmed out a lot of fat and mm -hmm. the, the performers that weren't hacking it in a remote environment, we, we had to, we had to invite them to find another job. Mm -hmm. right. I was going to say a good a good touch on that piece is not only that, but while during COVID, while we were all at home trying to for some of those that were trying to figure out how to work remote application software, we're figuring out how to make their technology amazing. I mean, look what happened with Zoom, right? And so we have all of this amazing new technology that now, sadly, I guess, depending how you look at it, replaces a rear end in a seat, which us as business owners saves time and money and forces somebody else to, you know, find some sort of new skill. But um, technology has really come a, a, a super long way and replaced mm -hmm. a lot of that we uh, roles that we needed actual people for. Yep. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, so our results here, so 40% are 100% remote and then another 20% are about 75% remote. So I think that's pretty interesting. And 25%, 24% are, I guess, in office, um, 0%. Yeah, I then, want to talk to those 24%, really. Yeah. Oh, there, <laughs> and there, I want to have the one-on-ones with those 60 percenters because I want to know the ones for the increase. Oh, sorry, Gary, I just... Right. No, I was going to say, so So I think we'll um, we'll get to share some, some experience and some reasoning, right, of moving remote uh, throughout this presentation. And then, um, si yeah, sixty percent have not seen a significant significant increase in turnover. So that's good. Sorry for the forty percent, but hopefully it worked out the way the way you two worded it, and that is uh, they found better opportunities. Um, yeah, so, absolutely. All right, let's roll into the next one. So I found this kind of in prep for uh, yesterday's session and today's session, uh, and I'll show you. And it came out of uh, selecthub.com, which I think is like a um, HR or to software kind of selection website. But so they did a survey and basically found that these are kind of the eight topics, cybersecurity to become an, uh, an even 
become even more important, which that's half of what this whole uh, two days is about. Power skills play a key role, and that's really kind of changing the skill set that they're focusing on with employees. Embracing the gig economy, DEI and spotlight, DEI being diversity, equity, and inclusion. Reskilling and upskilling, so uh, different, better training. Keeping the human touch alive, hybrid work model, and the transition from employee well-being to a healthy organization, which that one to me was, was I don't know, it was it makes sense, but it was one I had not heard before out of all of them um, that made me go, huh, I, I'd be interested to see how that works out. I mean, I think if you've got a good, healthy workforce and everybody's in a good spot, um, then that does make a company better. So I guess it does make sense. Some of the key findings, uh, flexible work model, which we're going to talk about, reduces attrition by 20%. And... 52%, this is a big stat, will be will be working or have worked as a contributor to the gig economy by 2023. Wow. Yeah, which that's a big number, right? So they're talking um, more of like Upwork or contractor type things. Like basically they're, people are wanting to move out of the, the traditional employee role into more of like owning their own schedule and what work it is they're doing. Is that what that's is that that's how I interpret that. Yeah, I, I didn't see the detail on it, but I it, it kind of two things comes to mind for me. One is that that now moving out of the workforce, I want to control my 100 percent of my own destiny. But I think there's also, you know, um, you know, the term, I don't know, came out, I don't know when it was a month ago, the quiet quitting. Quiet quitting. I press about that, right? Which, you know, yeah. I so I think a lot of that is that as well, where you know, hey, I'm I'm working, I'm doing my nine to five. Then after that, I'm going to make money elsewhere. Or really, I'm doing my nine to five and I'm doing half my, I'm doing my gig economy really from two to five from you know, while I'm actually being paid by my employer. Now uh, that is reality. Right? Yeah, I, mean, that's, I, I think that's what a lot of people come in the remote world see. Ooh, I can get paid while doing these things. And, right. and you know, yeah. and, and I think that goes to some of the things we'll be touching on today. So, Let's roll into the uh, first bullet point. Uh oh, sorry, somebody's calling. Spam mm -hmm. Rose. <laughs> Mom, I'll call you back later. Yeah, she called earlier, so hopefully she won't call again. Um, all right, sorry about that. So, best practices for ensuring the hybrid uh, remote teams meet the needs of the practice. So, let's talk just kind of a few minutes um, on you know what are some of the best practices that you found in your firm that you put in place. You touched on a little bit already, Sharon. So let's start with you, Sharon. Then we'll go to Elizabeth. I have to go, I'm gonna go off screen for a second. So I'll be uh, right back. You two uh, talking right. about yourself. No problem. Um, structure, 100% structure, right? I find that with a remote, so we are remote. There is no hybrid. If I ever had to go into an office to do anything, I get, I get stressed. I don't want to do it. I don't know about you. I don't want to do it. I don't want to, I honestly, let's get real right now. So it's seven something my time. I am, I love what I do, but I'm kind of a little bit lazy and not a, a get up, get ready person. So knowing I had to be up early for this call, I went to bed with a full, with my makeup and my hair on and I slept like this all night. So when my alarm went <laughs> off at seven, all I had to do was brush and put on a little bit of eyeliner. So I woke up like this. So that just gives you a little bit into my, my insight and how I like to work. But, um, you, I can't even remember where I was going with that. I just wanted to share with the world. Um, you have to have that structure in, um, oh, that was a thought. We're not all going to the same office. You can't babysit. You can't look over and see, oh, you know, Debbie's been playing solitaire on her phone for three hours. You can't see that. So you have to have structure. You have to have a, some sort of system to where you can look and see what's going on in case you're seeing red flags. I don't like to micromanage, but I do like to have the visibility um, more so really to where if somebody's working ridiculous amount of hours, we can find out what's wrong. Um, I'm more concerned about that than somebody stealing time. Hopefully nobody on here is trying to work with me and thinks they could steal time for a while, but, um, I get more worried about the team overworking, not having enough support. And then they're alone on an Island, right? So that structure and then, um, just enough meetings being slack is a fun channel we always have a fun channel where we throw 
you know, gifts and memes and, you know, I'm, I'm very serious. So of course there's nothing fun in anything that I do. Um, so that's, that's a way to keep up. And then the one thing I find is when people are remote is the, the meme that's, Hey, this could have been an email. So it's really finding that happy medium between we have a zoom conference phone call for absolutely everything when honestly I could have threw it in an email or Slack and now I'm just wasting, you know, eight people's time at half an hour each. So that's kind of how we do it. It seems to be okay. We just had someone yesterday that said, hey, can we start doing, instead of like these individuals or these months, can we start doing a team monthly where all of us get together? Um, we were doing it kind of a little bit and I'm like, oh, well, if they're asking, it's probably something they want. So I feel like I don't know. I, I I don't like meetings. I can't stand them. So I want them to have like a point or I, like I said, could have been an email. Right. How about yours, Elizabeth? We talked about it a little bit yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also have a very um, delineated reporting structure. Um, and for example, I meet with my execs on a daily basis. And then my execs, we have daily huddles. We're really big on daily huddles. So we have like our daily huddle every day. We have a very structured agenda just so the execs are all on the same page. And then um, we have team huddles like for 15 minutes every day from 9.30 to 9.50 where the team gets together without me um, and they address together like any rocks they have for the day, the deadlines, anything they need to move forward in the day or something that a client told them that we should all kind of be aware of or, or kind of like a training moment if there is a, such a thing, you know, if there's if something comes up that everybody should know. Um, so we do date, we try to do daily touch points, to be honest. And then as far as, um, and those work very well for communication, because like Sharon says, like, we just want to have like some sort of meeting rhythm. So that way we're not blowing up people's emails or, you know, in Slack, we kind of set, uh, send updates. We like to move very quickly. So we like to get information and anything, you know, done very quickly. Meetups, we do meet up with our Miami-based team, which we have six um, every other month. And this year we do, we're big on annual retreats. We've been doing annual retreats since 2016. My team really loves it. Even during the pandemic, we did an annual retreat locally in Florida. Um, and this year we're going to Cozumel, Mexico. And we have a team in Serbia also, and they just got back from Sweden for their retreat. So, you know, when we get together in person, I want it to be a fun event. I don't want to talk about work. I want, I want it to be bonding because we talk a lot about work all day. So that's, that's really been helpful for my team and all of my entire team are millennials and I have totally adopted their mindset. I agree. Um, I'm a myself and I'm just like, no, I mean, I'm, I love work, but I used to be all work and no play now. It's it's 50 50 sometimes a little bit more play than work, but I, that just means I've gotten more efficient and better um, and better at what I do because I want to be able to produce a high level of work or, you know, whatever it is for our clients. So then that way we could enjoy our life because at the end of the day, that's that's the point of, of this life for me. So yeah, that's fantastic. So let's uh, we're going to stay on this topic for just a minute longer. And that is, and, and you'll see in every one of our uh, major talking points, I added tech stack because, I mean, certainly your remote tech stack is critical. So kind of what are the, the cores and maybe just one minute on each, you know, from, from each of you, it's the core of your tech stack. I mean, how do you manage if you've got, you know, 10 people around the country, around the world? Um, what's, the, what's that central hub that, that you're, you're managing that process and the work with? Sharon, do you want to go first? Yeah. You go ahead. You spoke first. Your green oh, light okay. lit up right, first. Sure. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so I have an accounting information director who is who is in charge of our entire tech stack. Um, we use QBO. Uh, that's all we use at our firm. Uh, we don't mm -hmm. we don't we don't what is it? We don't divert from that yeah. platform. We standardize our tech stack. We use um, you know, Slack for internal communication. We use Carbon for project management. I love Carbon. We love the visibility. I love that we can at mention, you know, our, our, our the email. I don't have to forward emails. Um, we, we do a lot of, we do everything on Carbon um, pretty much. And then, you know, our typical tech stack for, um, for, our, for our clients, you know, the build.coms, the fathoms, the, 
you know, everything else, uh, Vertex, you know, so we use other type of tech stack. Again, I look at what we spend in e, you know, in technology, and it really is amounts to like one full-time person. And it, it's the best full-time person I can ever have because that, that tech stack expense really just like takes us to such a great level as far as efficiency and processes and standardization goes. We have checklists for everything. Nobody has to really, I hate to say it, nobody really has to like think, just go to the checklist and it'll tell you what to do per client. Yeah. That's how we have it so well drilled down. I just wish it was that easy. Do you, there are so many people that are like, I don't know what to do. I'm like, it's, it's there. It's, there. it's literally it's there. Right there. It's, it's, yeah. it's in front of your face. You just right. go to the top one and you get there. You yeah. click it. <laughs> no, don't do that one that says due tomorrow. Do the ones that yeah. are due today first and then then start on them anyhow. Exactly. <laughs> yep. It's brainless. <laughs> yeah. I'm a I'm a checklist. I've always, since I was a little kid, have had a notepad next to my bed. And before I'd go to bed at night, I'd have to write everything down I need to do for the day. And I'm talking like I was 12, right? Um, and I would always keep it by my bed, a little, just something where if I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm like, oh my God, I totally forgot that I have to do this. I'd write it down. So I think probably around 2014 is when I started moving into, okay, I rewrite my list every day. And now I'm adding people to my team and we started using Todoist anyhow. So I'm a checklist nerd. And when I manage the team, they almost make fun of me because I am just anal retentive about the checklist. I'm like, how do you know? Because when you're remote, you have to run your company like, and this is the morbid way. I need to find a better way to say it. But if I was hit by a bus, can somebody else jump in and take over? Sure. And you can't take over if you come to my house and have to take a picture of my whiteboard or look at my stickies on my desk. It has to be somewhere centralized. Everybody can get in. So of course we use Slack. We are also a hundred percent QBO. Um, we're, you know, I'm QBO all the way. Um, and then we, we just switched off of Teamworks, which I've loved for a long time, but we moved to Carbon. Um, it's meant for accounting. It's amazing. And then Keeper is the most amazing end of month close organization tool if you have multi-clients that you need to work on. So we're using Keeper. And then we also use, you know, CorePay is like my, my, it's a newer one of my favorites, but I found it and it is now my official favorite. Um, and then we use Ignition. Ignition's wonderful. Mm -hmm. We so do that's too. Kind of our, our, yeah, I feel like it's becoming like the norm in, in mm -hmm. accounting. Everybody's using Carbon and Ignition and Slack and their AP system. And, and I guess that's a good thing. I always... I'm an underdog kind of person, so I like to find the underdog software and give them a, a shot. Um, but, you know, when it works, it works, right? We were on Bill.com. I was a beta user, and we just barely switched because it's so – it, we just barely switched to CorePay. And, you know, I feel like switching software is such a hard thing to do, especially when you have a remote team. So, Well, if, I don't know if you recall seeing Guy Pearson at trade shows – eight years ago, dressed in his astronaut suit when they launched, well, when they brought Ignition here to the States. So no. going to your fighting no. for the underdog, I mean, they, they, they were fighting. And, uh, yeah, I, I and now love they're amazing. The yeah, I love I'm, the success they've had. I'm super passionate about FinTech. It's super passionate. Whenever I get into any sort of new software or tech stack, I, even though I may not be using it, I'm extremely hands-off. I've got the team, I've got the director level, everything. I want to know what we're using. I want to become certified because I want to know what my team's experiencing when they say to me, I don't know, I may have the answer or I can brain, you know, like, um, um, I, why wow, I just lost my words. We can brainstorm. There we go. Brainstorm together. And not only that, I like to look and hear, and then I want to go to the FinTech and say, Hey, so I use your software. Let me give you a little bit of constructive criticism or feedback or how to, what you could do. That'll make this absolutely amazing. And then it's, it's really fun to see them start like so little and grow to something amazing. feeling right. like you had a piece of that. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, all right, well, let me post there. On, actually, one more quick thing. Yeah. I was just thinking five years ago, if you would have told me today that I, or back then that in five years, I would be an advocate for technology and accounting and all this, I would be like, yeah, whatever. Because 
I when I'm accountants, like my brain is not wired for like technology. So I was always scared of this type of like environment. And I know with the pandemic kid, I had to shove myself, push myself, throw myself into this technology because I'm like, if I don't, my business is going to like, it's going to die. And I don't want my business to die. So that's another big aha moment. I am the typical like accountant that loved, you know, accounting, but now it's like, now I love technology. Now it's like, yeah. I think it's the answer for like, first of all, my business to survive and to keep up with today's, uh, today's businesses, you know, nowadays people don't want to like, they just want, you know, better, faster, more efficient and better results. Like the more accurate financial data, not like an accountant making journal entries and, oh, wow, they don't find that valuable anymore, you know? Right. No. And it's going to be replaced by technology anyways. And the one thing when it comes to our hiring, before we even hire somebody, we find out the need that we're hiring for, and we find out if there's some sort of software that can do it first. Mm -hmm. And then, or even a piece of it, that is our, our number one thing is, is there a software that can do what this human can do? Because if there's even one that can slightly do it, you better embrace it because if it can slightly do it, then in two years, it's going to fully do it. And you're behind the head, they're behind the time. So 100%, yep. All right, let me post this next poll. And that is, um, how do you find new talent for your team? Which uh, when nobody, want, nobody coming out of college wants to be an accountant, right? Nobody, I'm using very, very broad. <laughs> There are some weirdos out there. <laughs> There's still some, uh, but you know, when uh, tight, well, when nobody's working, but there's a tight labor market and nobody wants to be in accounting, you know, how do you find new talent? And um, choices, paid recruiter, ads, LinkedIn, Indeed, et cetera, and then uh, referrals, word of mouth. Uh, we'll let this roll for probably three more seconds and then we'll close it out and share the results and maybe ask you guys to give one minute each on, on these results. So here we go. sharing there we go all right elizabeth what do you think so linkedin is the number one referrals number two ads yeah, I, yeah for me um referrals and word of mouth have been uh the number one way for me to find top talent yep agreed same with you you're seeing that too okay so well, nothing what, what about mean, like it's my preference i would rather somebody i know and trust in the industry come to me that says hey guys i've got this person i I'm almost considering firing somebody on my team just so I can get them on my team, but I can't. So I want them to go somewhere amazing. I want that person because mm -hmm. I, I call, I, I always say that the accounting industry, we are the phone a friend industry. We don't Google, we don't, um, you know, we don't check sources. What we do is we ask our, our, our colleagues Yep. what their opinion are, who they're using, who they know, what they know. Before I post any ad, I go to all my accounting groups and say, hey guys, does anybody know anybody? And I get those referrals first because if people don't want to put their, their rear end on the line to somebody that they know and care about, if they're not going to give you someone that's terrible. So our, my word of mouth referrals are the, my favorite way of hire. And then, you know, LinkedIn and, and such, but I've, I don't think I can pay a recruiter. Honestly, I've done it before and it's not worth it. Yeah. Okay. So my, so I don't know that I get any better results. Like we have this, we, I've been doing this since 2006 and we have this tried and true process where three people interview, whenever we go to hire, they need to go through three interviews. I know that sounds terrible, but we're in a remote environment. We're not sitting in a room. So we do three different levels of people and we, they're not long. They're not grilling. I mean, do I look like I have like some structured, ridiculous thing? I want to get a feel for the person and their drive and what motivates them. Listen for keywords, but we have to get three yeses, not a maybe, not a let's see who else is out there. I want, um, love them. Yes. Love them. Yes. Love them. Yes. If we get anything other than that, then we pass. Um, because when we put an ad up for remote, I'll get hundreds of resumes, hundreds. How do you go through that? How? Like we narrow it down with all the questions and whatnot. And then, then we start, you know, and then you start doing little eliminators. And then usually there's one person that emails you 50 times because they want the job and they always get through. Persistency is, persistence is key there. So sure. yeah. real quick, um, for me, the word of mouth has been through my team. So I uh, asked my team, who do you know? 
and they have brought me the best people. And oh, by the way, I paid them five hundred dollar bonus. I was gonna say whenever, you. Whenever they them. bring me someone and they're there for ninety days, they get a bonus because That's in great. my mind, they're gonna want to bring in someone that they're gonna want to work with. Yeah. And already we've got you know their buy in. So that's and that, then if that person does terrible. It's like in the movies where they're like, I'm getting you this job, man. If you mess it up, I'm going to come find you. And I kind of <laughs> like that. I don't have to do a it. A million percent. Yep. Yeah. I, <laughs> that's funny. So, so on that, on our overall main talking point here, I threw these bullet points in. You guys haven't seen these. Um, no. or I, I guess I'm telling the, the audience that, that uh, this is new for them. But so referral, we just talked about that. Nothing, nothing beats that number one very personal referral, right? So mm -hmm. social, so I, I think these kind of all lump together, right? You have social, yeah. you have events, and or those two lump together. And events in particular, because I, in my opinion, because we go to the events, right? We go to all the accounting conferences and- I recruited my last two amazing people from conferences. Right, and so, Sorry, and I don't know- <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that a lot of people go to events thinking that, 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 Hey, this really? is a for I me do. to find people. I try to find the accountants that their employer sent them there, but they're not really happy with their employer. And I try to, or maybe the business owner that is like, I'm so exhausted. I just want to do what I love. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm like, I've got a role for you. I love right. those people. I, I look for those people. How about you, Elizabeth? Do you do you, we we've never met face to face? So I, uh, do you go to many of the events, like the accounting events? I I'm going more and more now. I yeah. am going more and more now. So I'm going to Digital CPA in December, and I definitely want to network with some people there. Um, you know, go to QuickBooks Connect. That's going to be a big one, and it's in oh, Vegas. I maybe I'm looking into that one. But the yeah. one that actually years ago really helped me build the team that I have today is I connected with a local university. I don't yeah. think that it would fly anymore. Um, so anyway, I, I, Join I, Join Handshake. Do you ever use that? Join Handshake. Yes. That's the yes, intern yes, app. Yes. Yes. Amazing mm -hmm. kids mm -hmm. on there. We've hired quite a bit of interns, like mm -hmm. the ones and each of them are in so many different areas and they're just so driven and we pay them. We, and yes. I think they're happy because they're being paid. They're like, Oh, it's a paid gig. Um, but then you, they also get credit, but we get some amazing interns on join handshake. So for everybody oh, out join, there, join handshake, is it? Uh-huh. It's an app. It's an intern for anything across the board, but they definitely have accounting, marketing, mm -hmm. everything. So a yeah. great intern resource. So the reason why I've kind of steered clear for me now uh, from the universities is because, yes, I was getting interns and I was doing, they were doing very well, but I realized that after a certain point, they would just leave us. And now I kind of want to build a team that's going to, mm -hmm. you know, be in there, be with us for the long haul. It was just so much of an investment to just, you know, yeah. train these interns and then they would get all this experience and then leave and pretty much leave us high and dry because they don't give us like a lot of notice. So I was like, no. you know what, I'm going to, I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> We yeah. utilize them for more of the, we have certain pieces, like more of the, the you know, we're teaching the basics, we're teaching mm -hmm. books. Um, and then of course, you know, we use Looms for a lot of our training to where we're not waiting, to where they watch it, they learn it. Um, mm -hmm. We try to get our training structure really in place where we bring them in. We're like, here you go. This is what you're going to do. And then really, honestly, I think it's about when it comes to interns, really finding out what their long-term goal is. Some of them that, you know, they're not going to be there long and that's okay. We prepare otherwise. There are some that they, they're looking for their, they think this is going to be their, they're going to be one of those stories where they came in, interned and worked the way up and now they're CEO. And I, great. What do you want to learn? I'll totally teach you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I feel like even with interns, I feel like we get that with people sometimes, like just regular right, you're right. people that are in, especially in this remote world. I, one thing that I always look at in the resumes is, you know, they have their own business. And while a lot of people love that, sometimes for me, I'm thinking you're looking for something to fill in the gap while you continue to find your own clients, which I respect, but come to me as a consultant, not a W2 employee. I don't want to pay you to run your business on the other side. I want you to be my full-time employee because we don't do hourly part-time anymore. If you come on with us, you're full-time, you're in it to win it. I want somebody dedicated kind of the same way that you are, except for those couple of interns here and there. Um, but again, they're more fill-in, 
but we want that full. And I think that makes a lot of difference, right? Especially in the remote world is that when you hire those contractors, gig workers, a few hours here and there, you get people that still need to pay their rent, feed themselves, have a life. So they're working for you 10 hours a week. What are they doing the other 30? They're working somewhere else. And guess what? If they go somewhere else, if they like something a little bit better than what you're giving to them, they're giving priority to that first and you're getting second. And I, we want something that's somebody's going to be dedicated to us. And on the flip side, I want a team member that feels like I don't have to do other things. I, my bills are paid. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. I have an amazing work-life balance. I feel like I have somewhere to grow. Um, my boss is not a, a grade A D bag, you know, is somebody who's a mate, they, you know, somebody somewhere that they can grow with. And, and that's essentially the goal. So you find as you bring new people on um, the tech stack, I told you we're going to have tech stack on here all the time. So do you find that that the tech stack, not in the onboarding process, but like if you're bringing in, you know, a younger worker and if you're still working in older technology, you know, for a phone based generation, they're going to like, no, nah, no, thank you. I mean, you find that they're, they're like, vocal though, Gary, the younger ones, say like, no, why are you, you doing this? this? Hey, boomer. I mean, you get that a lot. I have a huge millennial team and I am not a boomer. I'm a Gen X. No offense to boomers, but it's, you know, and they like to call me boomer because they're like, we're still, we're still in this older AP system. I'm like, that's it, gone. It, but then again, they're just, they're all younger. And so they think it's funny. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter calls me jerk. I'm not a boomer. <laughs> I, I'm like, I am Gen X. Stop it. I, yes, I'm not a boomer. My, my my brother was the last generation of boomers, so I'm close, but I'm not a boomer. So you're Gen X with me. Yes, yep. we're those ones that sit there. We're like, don't pigeonhole us, but we're Gen yeah. X. I'm, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, three Gen Xs, pretty cool. Yeah. I yeah. think I'm on the older scale of the Gen Xs here, but uh, all right. But we have so, a good. We have the boomer. Like we were raised in that real boomer work ethic. Like we started right. working when we were eight. You want it? Go get a job. Go get a paper exactly. out when I was eight. And then we have the millennials coming in. They're like, I just Googled that somebody on the other side of the country is doing the same thing. Less of time for way more money. Am I going to get this? We're like, no, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. If you want to drive to the other side of the country and go get the I job. I had a pager oh, no. that I had to beg for. And you've got the whole <laughs> freaking encyclopedia. <laughs> exactly. So, all right. Well, let's roll on to okay. our next question here. And here we oh. go. I didn't plan this. I didn't know what the next slide was. <laughs> yeah. So do you have a multi generational team? Unlike us, we're not multi generational. We're one generation here, just a bunch of Xers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're super multi. Well, are we? Are we? So we would so say yes to this, a, right? Boomers are really in retirement age. They really are. Like we are finding very young, young boomers or older Gen X because boomers are retiring. So I think the boomers that millennials are re are referring to now are us. I think we are the boomers in the workplace. Oh, place. is that what you know what I'm saying? Because I'm the old one. I'm all of my I team is this. like 20s and very early 30s. And I'm like, you know inching up in my early 40s but to them that's old that's scary and you know I think the oldest people on our team are like 52 but I think 52 is still Gen X right anyhow uh, yes. so we have yeah, no yeah. boomers we are X uh, millennial and Z yeah so I think, yes multi-generational I think I current, like my brother's 58 and he was the last that's year boomer. of, 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 uh, of boomers so all right so 72% say yes, they have multi-generational team, 16% say no, and 12% say not yet, but they will in the future. And you know, and, and certainly with the with the profession, right? The profession, if you go to shows, depending on which show you go to, certainly skews to the to the older side. And again, as we talked about before, with you know, nobody air quotes wants to be in the counting coming out of college. Um, so it's big issues. But you so think let's it's uh, because Oh, sorry. No, what do you got? Go ahead. Say, do you think it's because when people are in accounting, they're thinking of accounting as the book accounting that they're being taught in college, which is boring. It's debits right. and credits. It's the back end. They're only teaching you gap, right? In college, they're not teaching you what we do. And there's so many layers of accounting. Do you want tax? Do you want audit? Do you want fraud? Do you want to come into the other side of the spectrum where we're at and you want to do, 
you know, advisory and business and financials and cash flow. Like there's so, so much. So I think mm-hmm. accounting can be so I don't think I'm a boring accountant, but um, I think there's just so much more to it than what they're given in college. And maybe sure. those profess those boomer professors need to retire. We need to get some of us fun Gen X's in there to tell mm-hmm. kids that there's so much more to accounting than, you know, tax. Right. Tax is terrible. Sorry. Let's go on an audit. Yes. <laughs> but, um, you know, right. I always leave my firm because she wanted to be an auditor. She's like, it's my dream job to be an auditor for an insurance company on the financial side. I'm like, you mm-hmm. are a crazy person. I love you. Wish yeah. you the best. Go get that. <laughs> so out. Hey, glad, we, glad we have you, right? So yeah. uh, right, let's talk a little bit about uh, how we manage overhead costs and, and op- optimize the, the HR capacity. Again, I threw tech stack in there because um, it's on every slide because it has to be. Because if you don't have the right tech stack oh, yeah. to support this distributor workforce, you're going to have a whole lot of questions. You're going to be wondering, is anybody actually doing anything or are they actually working their second and third you know, gig economy jobs? So, um, so Elizabeth, what, how, how do you kind of manage some of that? And again, I threw these out there. So there, these may not be what fits your firm best, but how do you manage some of that overhead cost to, to optimize your, your HR? So we, with Carbon, we have full visibility of everyone's capacity. And we were constantly looking and moving and shifting work based on opening up capacity because as we're getting new clients in, we want to make sure we understand where everybody's at. So we use it through carbon. Um, and we also attach like budgets to every one of our clients. We've become so efficient in some in with some clients that we can't the retainer is no longer a good indication of the budget. So we have to run it a few months in order to kind of update what the budget would be. Um, so again, all through carbon, um, so cyber threats and keeping employees, um, we also have our IT company that has, I mean, I I haven't paid so much for IT in in my my entire life, but we use it for this, you know, the cyber threats, they monitor us constantly, um, with daily backups and making sure that we're safe. Um, and, uh, Let's see. Oh, and we do outsource. So we, I mentioned uh, before that we have a team in Serbia. Um, it's funny story is the main guy in Serbia used to work for me in Miami, but we couldn't sponsor him to stay in Miami. So he had to go back to his country in Serbia. He's six, nine, former college basketball player. Love him to death. He's a big teddy bear. And I'm like, I don't want to lose you. And so we figured out, we got a contract and we started working together while he's in Serbia. And he's actually built a team there. Of all these really tall people, another more six, you know, six two <laughs> woman, volleyball, professional volleyball player. You know, county? No, it's okay. Are you over six foot five? You're here. Yes, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So anyway, we've got a great team there in Serbia. Um, and and IT takes care of making sure that they log in very uh, safely. And we also have uh, someone in the Philippines. Again, uh, IT is taking care of their remote connection. So mm-hmm. yeah, and and yeah. So that's that's. That's where we're at. Yeah. How about yours, Sharon? Um, like it's, we talked about tech stack earlier. Um, there is every client does have a budget. We are all fixed fee. We know what it should be, what everything should be at. We have little notices that say, hey, you're going over. Um, we we have when we sign up our clients, they have a complete statement of work that's very detailed, like, hey, we will run your payroll for up to five people twice a month, you know, so we know what we're supposed to do. And if we have to, you know, a one-off is a one-off, but if they start needing more then the team knows, hey, this isn't in the SOW. So we take our SOW, we put it straight into carbon. And so if they're going to do a task and it's not, and it's not in there or it's different, they know that it's not in the SOW. And then they come in and they say, hey, they're asking for more. And then we have, then, then we really get into the client on like advisory and such as that. Um, prevention and cyber threats. I would love to get into this more, but for the best, best information on this, you'll want to tune back in at 12 um, Pacific, 3 Eastern, because I have another session with Andrew Wall, where we will be talking completely about prevention and cyber threats, and it'll be an amazing session. So hop back in on Future Forward um, for that for that session. Um, outsourcing, yes. So we we do, like I said, we really want to build, I'm kind of with Elizabeth, where we want to build a team that grows with us. 
Um, the one thing that we are, we're to the point now to where I finally have convinced my directors that, hey, maybe for our just for our real low level coding reconcile, coding reconcile, we need to outsource that. We need to let's get some sort of outsourcing team that that's all they do. And what you find with accountants a lot is that they hold on to things because they care. They want it right. If I do it, it's correct. If I give it to somebody else, it's wrong. And then I have to go redo it anyways. That's a lot of the accountant mentality. So to get accountants to let go of something is next to impossible. Sometimes you have to like undo it from their cold, dead death grip. Yes. Um, so, and then once you do though, you have to... I, I don't like playing that I'm the boss, you're going to listen to me, but sometimes you have to rank and say, this makes zero sense. We're not doing that. This is what we're doing. And instead, here are four options of how we're doing that. I'm going to let you pick whichever one of the four. I do the same thing with my husband. He thinks he's helped me decorate this house. He has not. What has happened is when I need something new, I find three to four of what I would want. And then I let him make that final decision. I have still chosen what is going to be there, but he thinks he has made that decision and helped decorate the house. So that's kind of what you have to do with your employees as well. Hopefully none of mine are watching this is say, hey guys, we're doing something new. Here's your options. You go pick which one. And then they're like, oh, we get a pick. Um, and then they're feeling involved. They're really invested in, in, in the company and you've, you've optimized a bit. So there's a little reverse psychology for you guys. It works. Oh my God. Is my but, husband out there? I'm <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You, we, we let y'all think that we don't understand what you're doing, but we really know what you're doing, but we let you think. That we <laughs> you don't understand. care. Yes. My husband loves decoration and remodeling as well. We both just regutted this house. I know I'm off topic, but he actually really likes being involved in that. So mm -hmm. that's my way of getting what I want with making him think. So, but That's he does know he's told friends this is what she does and i'm okay with yeah. it i'm like all right yeah. Same page. yeah and so when i threw these all these topics on this slide um but i want to make sure and i think you guys covered it very well because again y'all didn't see what i put on these slides before i put them up um was kind of how these are connected right i mean again yeah. the tech stack is critical to uh, managing the overall overhead cost and then but budgeting for that as part of that, you know, that HR section of your business, right? And the prevention, which we talked about yesterday in, I guess, in, in one of the cyber um, sessions, that prevention to do it really right, and, and Sharon, you're going in more on this later, three o'clock Eastern, um, requires some training. It requires the right tools, and it requires, you know, having your employees in the right mindset. And I know that's part of what y'all are talking about later. So it's, but it's all part of, of managing that HR cost that we didn't necessarily have you know, 15 years ago. Certainly not at the level we have it now. Right. So, all right, let's roll on to the next one. We do have another uh, polling question. Looks like we've got about, we're right at 50 minutes. So we'll get this polling question posted and then uh, probably bounce over to see what kind of questions we have. Actually, if you guys wouldn't mind seeing, looking in the Q&A while we run this poll question and then see oh if Oh my goodness, I have not even been looking the entire time, I'm the worst. There's just a few in there, so. Okay. Um, well, we've yeah, been guys, so- Yeah, throw your questions in, in now. What's that? I was just saying, throw your questions in now yeah. so we can get to know. Look, Jonathan Bellow, I run across him so often. Hey, Jonathan. <laughs> Uh, all right. So are you trying to scale your firm with remote? What do you guys, how do you think it's going to turn out? Um, a lot of yeses and a lot of no, but we're thinking about it. I, okay. I think is where we're going to land. No. Um, Elizabeth, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. Well, let's uh, keep this open for- Well, if I was on the other here. end, I would purposely click no just to mess with me. I'm not, <laughs> I've been like- change my answer yeah but they're accounting professionals right mostly so they're gonna so be like, am i gary so uh, am i <laughs> yeah you're the outlier you're the outlier so all right so we're gonna close this up again if you need cpe you got to hit three out of four of these so hopefully you got what you needed so here we go Happy. share it and you are correct so 50 percent, 56 say yes we're looking to uh remote and then uh 30 percent. but we're thinking about it so you're spot on and so we'll stop sharing that. Any uh, any questions you want to address directly in the Q&A? Um, practice 
it's ignition. Um, I, I don't know. It, so that's a, a question that I feel like needs more information. Example, how much time are you spending? Um, if you are doing... Well, hold, hold on one sec, Sharon. So the whole question was, how many clients or potential oh, yeah, nobody else do, you think you need, yeah, do you need in order to make practice ignition worth the investment? So yeah. I would say it depends how you're doing it right now. If you're signing one to two contracts a month, I think it's worthwhile completely. If you're doing one or less a month, probably not. Um, if you're doing more, two or more, absolutely, because then it's completely automated. Not only that, it's your billing system, your automated billing system. It'll tell you when something needs to be renewed. Um, the per, your, your end user is, or your client is putting in all their information. It, you honestly, once you get it set up, it just rolls. Um, it, yeah, I, I think if you're doing more than more two or more a month, it's worth worth it. I'm going to chime in really quick, and I have a pretty interesting metric. So my six nine Serbian was taking two full days to reconcile our accounts receivable every month. Granted, you know we we do charge automatically every month, and yep. he had to go, and it took him two entire days to do the reconciliation and. Let's just say now he spends zero time because Ignition yeah. does it all. And now he can yeah. actually work on clients instead yeah. of helping us do this. So yeah, all you do is you look at your, your QuickBooks to see if there's anything laying there. And then you, you go and you pull it up in Ignition. And usually it's, um, and they'll tell you, hey, this thing's anyhow. Yeah, yeah it's, it's extremely worth it. And they're coming a long way. They, um, they read into QuickBooks. I can't wait till they they read into HubSpot. They read into Carbon. Um, it's an amazing it's an amazing product, and they aren't practice ignition anymore. They're ignition, mm -hmm. which is still it's rough. Um, try googling ignition and see if you get that. You have to Google practice ignition. So <laughs> that's a really good point. So, uh, and I think both of you. The next question was about uh, do you track track hours to bill clients or flat fees? I think you both said flat fee, right? You got to go fixed fee. Everything is fixed fee now. Fixed fee, set a budget. Have a really good SOW. Uh, the last thing clients want is a surprise invoice at the end of the month. One month we were 500. Next month we were 3,000. They hate that. Define your scope of work in your agreement. Lay out your scope of work. Put your price to that detailed scope of work and keep doing that scope of work. If the scope of work changes, renegotiate. That is the best way to do it. Clients are always happy. You may have some ebbs and flows in your hours. Maybe maybe it's a 10 hour a month client. One month is five hours. The next month's 15. You're, you're budgeting that and you're tracking that and you know you're okay. Um, that's how we do things. And I don't get angry emails in the end of the month. Why do I have this ridiculous invoice? So-and-so shouldn't take it that long. It doesn't matter. And then not only that, you've got the fixed fee and you're allowed, then you're allowed to make efficiencies on your side. So what should, what have taken 10 hours, maybe you got down to five because you're so efficient and now you've just made more money per client. Nice. Yeah. So the question, yeah, we track out, we track our time. We definitely track our time and we we, even though we are fixed fee, we track our time and every month um, the exec team and I go through monthly profitabilities. We even look at every quarter. We make sure to do quarter versus, um, you know, quarter versus quarter uh, profitability. And I'm in the process now of speaking with clients to up retainers because we, mm -hmm. even though we don't charge by the hour, we do have like a blended rate we're shooting for. And so if a client is below the blended rate, then I have a conversation and we up it, you know, we up the retainer. Fantastic. All right. Well, we are about at the end of our time. Certainly appreciate, uh, appreciate the two of you sharing your, your depth of knowledge with us. And I uh, do also want to say thanks to our sponsors one more time, Tech Guru, Davo by Avalara and SwissNet. I think we need to have uh, Carbon and Ignition need to be sponsors in the future, right? <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> but, you know, if you have a good tool, you have a good tool. And, and, and we certainly wouldn't, we would never say, oh, don't talk about a company that's not a sponsor. Uh, if that's what's in your tech stack, that's what people need to hear. And so again, but, but thanks to the sponsors, TechGuru, Davo by Avalara and Squiznet. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Sharon. Certainly appreciate your time. Sharon, we'll see you in a few more hours and uh, you can go get a power nap between now and then. And again, just for everyone. We will be sending a uh, follow-up email out in the next day or so. Uh, CPE, you'll get an email with the link to the survey, complete the survey, and then you'll get the certificate. We'll also be sending the link to the website where this 
uh, recordings will be hosted, as well as a link to a, like a box folder with the presentation. So thank you all. Thanks again to our speakers. Thanks for everybody taking some time out of the day. And hopefully we'll see you all very soon. Thank you. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.